Up next, the masterful performance of Mayor Pete Buttigieg in his Senate confirmation hearing this morning. The next Transportation Secretary will join us next. You were on the Tonight Show last night with Jimmy Fallon. Yes, sir. And you're on the Morning Joe show this morning. Um, in terms of, of, of a, a thrilling experience, how does being before this committee today compare to those? I would characterize this as a unique experience, Chairman. It didn't get much more difficult than that for President Biden's nominee for Transportation Secretary in his confirmation hearing this morning. Here's what the outgoing chairman, Republican Senator Roger Wicker, said about the nominee. Mayor Buttigieg has impressive credentials, which demonstrate his intellect and commitment to serving our nation. There are only two kinds of nominees who get treated like that in confirmation hearings, senators and people who are smarter than senators. Pete Buttigieg is not a senator. Every Republican senator, including extremists like Marsha Blackburn, treated our next Secretary of Transportation with respect and friendliness, except, of course, Senator Cruz, who did not dare challenge Pete Buttigieg on any policy issues, but he did reach for his rhetorical specialty, that tone of voice that only to him expresses a sense of superiority over the person he is speaking to. When I worked in the Senate, I used to schedule confirmation hearings in the Finance Committee and manage all of the staff work for those hearings. I've seen more Senate confirmation hearings than I could ever count, and what I saw this morning was Pete Buttigieg delivering a master class in how you handle your Senate confirmation hearing. Any kids out there who want to grow up to be Secretary of Transportation or Secretary of anything, just watch how Mayor Pete did it today, but always remember, it's what he did before today that made it so easy. Homework. Joining our discussion now, Pete Buttigieg, President Biden's designee for Transportation Secretary. Thank you very much for joining us tonight at the end of this long day with your confirmation hearing. And you might not believe this, but it may be your husband and I are the only people who did this. I watched every word of your confirmation hearing from, <laughs> from, from start to finish. Uh, it's what I do. Well, well, thanks uh, for following and, along. And I have to say, uh, w one of the things that was demonstrated is, is, is really what a solid choice you are for this because of your background. You made a point that I hadn't thought of, which, which is that you come from the kind of bottom end of the user system of federal transportation policy. As a mayor, you're down there at the bottom of this chain that flows through funding chains on things that flow through the federal government, uh, through state house, through governors, uh, into localities. And, and that's what everyone in Washington is always wondering about, is they wanna know how do we get that pavement actually on the ground and where does it go? And that's a unique experience you're bringing to this. You know, that is a big part of what I, I hope to bring into the department. You know, when you were a mayor, you, you've had that experience of, uh, you know, hoping to get a call returned by the Department of Transportation, the experience of uh, trying to compete for limited funding that, that the DOT is making available, dealing with the regulatory framework that the federal government has. Uh, remember, you know, federal government doesn't just regulate companies. It, it regulates cities and, and states and communities. And uh, my hope is that having that perspective will uh, help me make sure Sure that the department is user friendly for uh, the many communities that uh, we really need to make sure that we're supporting with the historic opportunity that I believe is in front of us right now to make a, a generational level investment in the infrastructure of this country. You know, at the end of the day, those dollars can be authorized in Washington, decisions can be made in Washington, but everything depends on whether they can be effectively delivered and deployed in communities across the country. Uh, I want to go to a safety issue that no previous Secretary of Transportation has ever had to deal with. Uh, the president talked about it today, and that is masks in public transportation, interstate transportation, every airport, every airplane. How are you going to enforce that? What's, what's the mechanism in place that's ready to go for that? 
Yeah, the DOT has always been about safety, uh, whether we're talking about the FAA and uh, air travel in this country or any of, the, any of the other kind of dimensions of the department. Usually, when we think about safety and transportation, of course, we're thinking about preventing crashes, uh, and, and that continues to be a core mission of the department. But now, we've been reminded of a whole other element of traveler and worker safety and transportation. That's preventing the spread of the virus. It's why uh, the, the president acted right away with an executive order that's laying out the need for mask mandates to use those federal authorities, whether we're talking about airports, airplanes, uh, intercity buses, trains, essentially wherever there's a, a federal responsibility to keep passengers and workers safe, that extends to doing something about keeping them safe from COVID. Uh, we're going to be, uh, if confirmed, I'll, I'll have a chance to uh, join a, a department that is already getting to work on implementing and executing those orders because there's no time to lose. The authorities are there. Uh, we've got to make sure that they're used in the right way to keep Americans safe. And, and in the end, you know, we, we all want to see a return to normal. Part of what it's going to take uh, to, to build back a transportation and travel industry that's, that's really been decimated by this virus is for there to be a perception and a reality uh, that uh, any traveler is safe, which of course means making sure those safety measures are in place. You talked about something today that I've heard others uh, struggle uh, trying to phrase correctly, uh, what you call transportation equity. Uh, and it's the concept of uh, we, we might need different things for different people. And, and somebody, you know, who has a $150,000 Mercedes and pulls out of the driveway just cares about what's, what's going on in the pavement uh, in his community. Uh, the person who might come to clean that person's home has to care about the bus system, might have to care about the rail system in other ways of getting to that same place uh, that, that wealth allows you to just drive to and from. How do you take that into account in, in real policy terms? That's right. Tr transportation equity means making sure that, that uh, we have policies that serve everybody, uh, whether you own a vehicle or not. Uh, whether you live in an area that has historically been well served with uh, a lot of transit routes or, uh, or uh, well-funded infrastructure or not. And we know, uh, for example, when it comes to racial justice in this country, uh, this is one of the biggest things that I think is at stake in transportation policy. So many neighborhoods, often black neighborhoods, uh, one of two things happened. Either they didn't get transportation resources at all, were neglected, had transit deserts, meaning that residents were cut off from opportunity, or the opposite happened. Investment happened, but it happened in the worst way, like in the form of a highway going right through a neighborhood. And, and again, often this was in predominantly black and, and brown neighborhoods that didn't have the political power to resist uh, some of what was going on or to weigh in to shape it. Uh, this is something we have a historic opportunity to do something about because I think we're going to be positioned to make historic investments. And so uh, listening is going to be so important, uh, listening to local leaders, uh, engaging with, with state and local and, by the way, territorial and tribal uh, uh, citizens and, and governments that have so much at stake. And that's part of what I'm, I'm really excited to do in the department. Uh, I don't know if you maybe you pro I think you're too humble to have picked up the dynamic in the room today, but uh, you had a lot of people who are basically supplicants to you today. They know you're going to be the Treasury Secretary. They know you're going to have a, a hand in uh, funding and, op uh, and, and projects that can affect uh, their lives. That's why you were getting all those invitations. Uh, Senator Wicker wants you to come to Mississippi. He wants to show you some projects down there. Uh, Senator Sinema wants you to come out to Arizona, see the interstate projects she wants to work on. Ed Markey, of course, needs you to come up to the Cape Cod Canal to see the Sagamore Bridge and the Bourne Bridge that need to be replaced. Uh, you got a lot of invitations, uh, and that is, of course, because they recognize they're going to have to come to you when those big packages are being put together involving financing of those kinds of projects. How do you sort them out? How do you look at a project and say, this one has value, uh, this one does not measure up to the value of the other one? Well, we've got to make sure that we are transparent about the criteria, especially uh, as grant programs are developed. And those criteria have to include a lot of things. Uh, it's making sure that uh, it leads to the main economic and, and other policy priorities that the president's put forward. 
Uh, you know, we, we just spoke about equity. Clearly, uh, that's going to be an important consideration. Climate is a huge consideration because, uh, you know, some transportation projects show more promise than others in helping the U.S. lead the world on dealing with greenhouse gas emissions. Remember, the transportation sector right now is the largest sector in the U.S. contributing uh, to, to those CO2 emissions. So, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to working. I'm looking forward to the trips for sure. Uh, I have uh, been invited everywhere from the Gulf Coast to Alaska, and I'll, I'll uh, certainly be eager to do that, but also to working with these senators to make sure that we're, we're meeting those policy goals uh, with all of those projects that we're contemplating. My favorite invitation was uh, Senator Young inviting you to Indiana, where, of course, you live. Uh, but everyone got the joke. Uh, next, Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, thank you very, very much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. Please come back whenever you can. I'd love to. Thanks for having me. Thank you.